G'day and welcome. My name's Mark Tennant. A number of you will remember me from your undergraduate days or maybe we've met at the college primary examinations. Uh, I'm part of the team that uh, presents the Dental Sleep Medicine Program and uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to share some experiences and to share some of the science that underpins this important topic. My mission for this little part, your first part in the process of joining this course, is to talk a wee bit about evidence, where you get it from, and your ability to collect information in an orderly and reasonable fashion. I also want to talk a wee bit about what's the best evidence, where do you collect the most uh, stable evidence base to underpin your practice and in fact what I'm going to do is I'm actually not going to specifically talk about dental sleep topics because that's not my expertise. My plan is to actually talk about in general how do you collect information and how do you filter the rubbish out from the gems that will uh, make your practice a better practice. Technically there are five lectures in this program, but I think if you had to listen to me for uh, five half hour slots on this topic, uh, I'd be wasting your time to start with, but also you'd be very bored with what I had to say. What I'm going to do is I'm going to talk for about 30 or 40 minutes today. I'm going to then provide a series of other videos that I think do justice to the various components that I want to talk about, do more justice than I could actually bring to the topic. So I think it's probably better that you watch these sequence of videos, some about Medline and PubMed and the process around that, some about Cochrane reviews and the Cochrane library and what that means, and the optimum way to use these tools. And in fact they are going to be the core that I'm going to provide you with. What I want you to remember is that information comes to you in all sorts of forms. You know, I know, I see it. I get it in the envelopes in the post box as well. All of this advertising material all telling us that this or that is better than something else and buy our new resin based restorative material because of this, this and this. Really, we are bombarded with new information now as practitioners. And the art in practicing evidence-based healthcare in any setting now is to be able to filter through all of that information and distill down to the core evidence that you need. And really what you are doing in that process is you're actually weighting the evidence. You're giving some more priority over others. And I think one of the exercises that I regularly go through in my own mind is to actually reflect on how I weight evidence. I also then look at what that weighting really means. Am I weighting evidence from sources that I receive it in a manner that is consistent with what the world's best practice clinicians are doing? What do I mean by that? Well, even just this week, we go out to dinner regularly with other clinicians, a number that I highly respect in various topics, some world leaders. And clearly when those people say to me, this new type of restorative material, this new way of treating periodontal disease, that has great weight in my mindset. I'm hearing it firsthand from another source. However, when you sit down and reflect upon that evidence, that's not necessarily an appropriately balanced method to change the way I do things from practice. So despite me on a day-to-day -day basis listening to many people and hearing much evidence come to me, I actually take that evidence and go to a more detailed process to analyse what I think of that evidence 
and what evidence from that I can take to then translate into the practice of my uh, uh, of what I do. So I think it's really a, an important principle message to get through first is actually reflect on the ways you get information and what you value most in that information and does that reflective process actually have meaning to underpin changes in your practice or do you need to take that evidence and weigh it in an appropriate manner against much more rigorously undertaken evidential production. So let's move along with the story and start to talk about some of these things. What I want to do firstly is actually talk about a random research paper. I'm choosing one of my own because I had the PDF sitting on my desk at the time and uh, I thought we'd spend a few minutes talking about how the scientific process has come about weighing evidence and putting evidence towards practice. So here we have a typical research paper that uh, I'm sure you're all read many of these, probably hundreds of these in your lifetime. I just want to sit for a little while and actually reflect on what these, uh, what these, uh, how these are structured in terms of providing you with a level of evidence and a level of support that you can rest on to consider changing your practice. And I want to start to introduce to you the idea that you need to actually reflect upon the quality of this. Just out of interest, we've just been working on the rates of publications in the dental literature over the last 40 years. And uh, 40 years ago, there were about 400 publications a year on the areas, on the wide area of dental in the international literature, about 400 a year. And today, it ranges up towards 7,000 papers a year. So clearly, even when you get these, as I said, similarly to when you get uh, information from a friend or a colleague, with there being seven or 8,000 publications a year now, you actually have to look at these and provide some weighting to the quality of the evidence within these as well. And for example, this paper here, the first thing I look at, is I look at the journal that this paper has been published in. Now this paper's in a journal called the International Dental Journal. And you can't just take that and go, oh, okay, well, I understand that that's a very low ranked journal. Because it gets quite complicated now with the plethora of, of information pathways. Authors, such as ourselves, pick a journal based on the audience that is going to be reading it. So for example, you can see this, this paper is not a restorative dentistry paper and therefore it will never get into what in, a, what in the grand rank of things would be a high ranking journal. However, in the topic of marginalised communities, which this is about, the International Dental Journal is ranked extremely highly. So you can start to see the problems you face in terms of balancing up evidence. At an initial glance at this, you'd head this straight to the rubbish bin. But if I said to you, in the context of the material within it, this is the first or second ranked journal in the world for these sorts of materials, that we should change the balance in which you look at these sorts of papers. So that's the first thing I look at. The other things that I think are important is how we do references. And we're not going to go through actually producing references and things. You know, you can see these references here. They're all numbered throughout this paper in a sequential order. Um, referencing is something that started out. In fact, the very first scientific paper ever produced back in the 1500s uh, had references in it. So, uh, you know, this is a, a long style process that has evolved over five or six hundred years. And it's really showing us that every sentence where we make a point from 
to support an article has to be referenced in an appropriate manner with an evidence base behind it. And referencing in journals is just that. All we're doing is saying, hey, listen, the sentence we've produced is not just Mark Tennant making up some random sentence. It's actually based on bricks of evidence that have been previously laid down by generations before us. So that's the first thing to notice when you read a paper. You always make sure you read through and, you know, sentences that have depth of meaning or importance should always be supported by references. And I'm just going to rush to the end and have a look at those references now to talk about those. And I'm just going to pick some random ones here. Let's just up the mag a bit so we can see it. And here we have a sequence of references, and, and I actually haven't looked at them myself, but I, I, uh, it's good to, for you to see actually how in live time experience people actually reflect upon uh, the references. Clearly, you're looking for the strength of the evidence behind things. When you look at a sequence of references, the first thing you want to know is has that reference undergone some sort of peer review. Now in this day and age that can actually be tricky to find out. In the old days it was relatively simple but it becomes trickier and trickier now. And on most occasions you know you can see for example here's a the Journal of the Canadian Dental Association. Um, you will start to learn that these are full peer reviewed anonymously reviewed publications so they hold a greater weight than, for example, the one above it. There's a good example. The one above it is from the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, a government organisation, which is purely a uh, printed publication that has not gone undergone any peer review. Actually, now I look at it, I'm picking on one that I was actually part of the authorship team for, which is a bit embarrassing, but we'll let that go. So you can see those two references, reference two and three, in my mind, immediately have a different level of weighting. The evidence that reference three supports, I would have much more comfort in because it's gone through a peer review process. Whereas the evidence supported by reference to in this case, which is just, uh, <laughs> I was going to say a magazine then, but uh, you can see the principle I'm getting to. You're actually hearing the words that come out of my brain when I read references. I call those magazines because they haven't undergone any peer review. The other thing I want to point out in this process is not all peer review is the same. And today we have all sorts of interesting journals Peer review in its historical 500 year history has been a process of anonymous comment that goes back to authors that then allows them to refine their publication before it's published. Some anonymous reviews are harsh to the point where a journal says, look, this is not of adequate standing for publication. And I'll let you into a little secret. The greatest piece of science ever done in human history, Einstein's theory of general relativity, was rejected from journals in the first iteration. And, it, and uh, so even the best get rejections. So when your time comes to write a paper, don't worry about rejections. You just move on and learn from them. Getting back to our story, that anonymous process improves the rigour and the evidential base underpinning the new evidence that is being promoted. So that's a very important part of the process. In modern times, that has somewhat been warped by the demands of increasing publication volume across the planet. And in fact, we now have all sorts of interesting journals where there is charging to publish or where there is, and in fact this week I had one that I actually refused to review a paper for a journal where it was not anonymized, where the reviewer's comments 
and their name was going to be returned to the authors. Now, there's good and bad in that. It means that, for example, I can't write, you know, Billy Smith has red hair and I don't like any papers from people with red hair. It clearly clears up those sorts of issues. But remember, journals don't actually ever send an article to an individual for review. They usually send it to two, three, four people for review. So those sorts of problems are ironed out normally. But on the other hand, it means that to stay uh, respected within my community, I have to be somewhat more circumspect with how strongly I comment on a paper. So in my view, that diminishes the quality of the review process and therefore diminishes my perspective on the level of evidence. Now I'm just looking down this list to see if I can see any of those journals in the lists. No, I can't. And there's irony, one of, one of our papers, and we uh, avoid using those sorts of references. In fact, just purely to understand how scientists operate, uh, we as a group have taken a philosophical position that we don't believe in what we colloquially call pay-as-you-go journals, and therefore we don't publish in those. We support the principles of 600 years of history. So that's the first thing you look at when you look at papers. The second thing you look when you're looking at these for the level of evidence is the quality of the journal in respect to the topic in which it's published. You will hear about things called impact factors and citation indices and things like that. Frankly, they're not useful in, in small fields such as dentistry or probably sleep science as well. Impact factors are a measure of a, a popularity index, in a sense, in, uh, over a complex calculation. And journals use them to compete against each other and all sorts of reasons for having impact factors. But in reality, an impact factor is not cognizant of the subset of the discipline you are operating in. And as I said, this is a classic example. This paper published in a journal that uh, the cancer specialists of the world would just wouldn't even use it to line their waste paper baskets. But in the context of the discipline and the sub-discipline, it, uh, uh, it, it is different. So when you look down a set of references, you know, for example, here's the Australian Dental Journal, in the context of in, um, Aboriginal dental health, which you can see here is the, is the paper by K. Roberts Thompson here, that's a pretty reasonable journal to get a topic like that into. It's not often that you see articles of uh, marginalised people in the Australian Dental Journal. So that's a, a, a well respectable uh, evidential base to the reference. And then you can go further and further through this set and see all sorts of ones. You know, J. Periodontol Periodontology 2000, a highly respected journal in its field, particularly in the area in which that reference is supporting smoking, uh, smoking and periodontal disease. So that is uh, the second level that you use to assess the quality of the underpinning evidence to support the next brick in the wall of a story. Look at the quality of the journals. Now at first it's all a bit bamboozling and you don't know which journal's better than which other journal and you're sort of left at a bit of a loss. Um, the way to learn is to actually grab some papers that are highly respected in your discipline, read them and start to look through which journals they're in. The other thing that will do to you is we'll start to pull into your mind the core authors and that's the third element that I use in my assessment of the level of the quality of evidence the authors the groups and where they come from now notwithstanding that if, if everyone did that all the time Einstein's special relatively relativity would never have got up it was it was his uh, special was his first paper 
and general was his second. So you know you have to take that with a grain of salt. So, uh, but still, looking at the author collection and where they come from gives you some extra balance in the way you read evidence and the way you support evidence. That's where I'm going to stop there, looking at this paper. We're not going to talk about the actual details of it at all. I'm now going to go on and talk for a little while on how we find evidence. There is so many. In fact, in the last 40 years, our students have just sorted by hand through 150,000 dental articles to do that research paper. So there are a lot to look through, and how do you search and how do you find this strong evidence base that you need to support things that you hear and read about in lower levels of evidential material. So let's have a look at probably the most important way of collecting evidence. And at this point, we should acknowledge the, <laughs> the government of the United States of America, because the government of the United States of America started off uh, and continues to fund to billions of dollars uh, this system called PubMed. PubMed historically uh, was called Medline. Um, it's gone through a number of iterations and it now is sort of the common source for peer review literature in the scientific, primarily health field. Billions and billions of articles are reviewed and collected together and sorted. And in fact, I think, uh, oh, it says on the front page here, you can see, in fact, uh, there are 24 million live citations that you now have the opportunity to search. They continue to grow this database. This database is growing both in width so the numbers of journals it covers is increasing, but it's also growing backwards in time. When I first started on the journey of, well, in fact, when I first started science, it didn't exist, but when it first existed, it only had articles back through, uh, through the 80s. We are now back down through the 60s and into the late 50s with articles, and uh, it's it's, well, I'll tell you, it's my uh, default page on my web browser at work. So you can understand for a person who is into science, this is sort of the Google of scientific peer review literature. Now, it doesn't do anything in the sense of ranking papers by quality or giving them quality indices or anything like that. It's purely uh, a... Uh, repository of those materials and there's a few tricks and, and things that I want to show you but the first thing I want to show you is here there's actually some really good tools to learn how to use PubMed effectively and in fact it's a fantastic tool I have it set up um, as a user I have it set up that every Saturday morning it sends me a list of the key publications that have come out in topics that are close to my heart in the last week. So it gives me some uh, weekend reading, um, but it can be fully automated to do all of those sorts of tasks. So it's, a, it's an astonishingly complex tool that is well worth spending some time learning about. And in fact, a list of the videos I'm going to leave for you to watch instead of listening to me will include some of the basic methodologies of using uh, PubMed effectively. I'm going to show you some now of the really simple processes, but please, and it's very important, you know, huh, I think everyone who teaches uh, any sorts of courses says that theirs is the most important course of all. But uh, in this case, I think the underpinning advantage that you can bring to your practice by knowing how to use the tool that is PubMed will be substantial. So please spend a little time. You've got some time now, so use that to understand how this works. 
So to give you a quick demonstration, and, and I'm not going to go too far, but uh, you know, for example, let's do something very simple. That it acts exactly like Google in the first instance, and then I'll show you a more complex process. So for example, we could go uh, dental sleep. Um, and there you go. It already has some pop-ups. Pop let's just do apnea, and we search for that. And you can see how it comes up with lists. You know, here we go, we've got uh, 20 references. Uh, each page has a 20 on it, and there's about 800 references or 750 references on this topic. So you can work your way down. It usually orders them, as you can see, by the most recent. And it's pretty well up to date. It's usually only sort of a six weeks behind with most journals, uh, most of the big common journals. Um, so then you can look down the list here. If one is of interest to you, you know, actually, why don't we do something else here? Let's just do another little one just for entertainment. And we'll look up uh, Chris Panton, Panton and Tennant. So interestingly, ah, there you go. Um, interestingly, just so when you're looking at that, you'll notice all of a sudden I've just gone to two authors' names. At, it, at this very raw level, it does a best fit and thinks through the words and, and worked out that they were authors, but I'll show you how you can be more effective in that. And here's a little paper that Chris and Dave Hillman and myself from many years ago. It's going to be frightening when I say that's a decade old. It feels like yesterday. And here's how it comes up as a piece of work. They actually index and have the abstract on them, so you can actually read the entire abstract. If you click on them, you can actually see more information about where the publication was done. At the top, it obviously has the journal. Um, and now what you can do is, you know, you can I immediately look at this and go, sleep, is that a good journal? Is it peer review? You know, the process I talked about before. So you can actually start to understand the paper uh, and, and give it some relative weighting. Um, a neat thing that I use when I'm just sort of cruising is over on this side here, it actually gives you some more similar articles that often lead you on a pathway. Now in this case, it doesn't give you the actual article itself, because clearly these journals are funded by the advertisements and the sponsorship that they get, so they don't have a direct link to the full article. And this brings me a little tip. If you ever want to use an article for your research purposes or for your education and things, if you go to computers down in the university precincts, any university precinct, they have special connections to uh, the uh, database system. And those special connections will sometimes pop up in the corner here, click here, to get full article. Now that is only from computers within universities or education sectors or research institutions and it depends on what licenses they have paid for to get them. So it's quite variable but certainly for your course and while you're with the University of Western Australia and in fact there are ways and I'm going to give you some contacts and things on the, the LMS that you can take advantage of those contacts for your coursework to get articles in full. So that's a, a neat trick to remember. You know, I use this where I'm currently sitting at home making this video, so you can't see any of them here. But normally with sleep, for example, as a journal, a little square would come up here. Actually, I know one. Um, let me just do one. YouTube. and tenant. There we go. <laughs> Here's one we did ages, well, middle of last year with one of our student colleagues. It was an interesting little journey about how to use YouTube for teaching. But why I'm putting it up is look over here. You can see that this journal is actually open access journal. So you can actually click directly on here. I'll do it. You can see what happens. We click on here.
and this will take you to the full journal. Ah, it's not open access. When I'm at work, this box doesn't come up and uh, the paper's right there in front of me so I can just see the full PDF from there. So uh, you can see it's, uh, it just depends on what computer you are using. So let's go back to where we were. So that's the basic use of PubMed. You notice in this case it's been quite clever. It's, it's, it's made the decision that that's my name whereas that's a word within the title or the abstract that they'll search for. If you want to be more specific with it, you can use the Advanced tab. And when you go to the Advanced tab, it gives you a much more uh, refinable process to search by. For example, you can go uh, tenant, but I only want that as a first author. In fact, that'd be interesting. I don't think I'm first author on any, not since ages ago. And then you could do something like, um, oh, I know, my good friend Esty, but I don't want any Esty papers. And I want one that in the title is the word blood. We'll pick the title. There's the title here. I'll find it in a minute. If you go at the bottom here, it'll be here in the title. And then you can do that search, and we'll just do that for now. There you go. Now, you notice, you notice that some of these, obviously I said my name's Mark, so JN is not me. So we can refine the search. And, and continue going. You'll notice up in the box here, it's actually showing you what, you what you've actually done in terms of that refined search. And I'll tell you, after a while you learn how to just type those out and the, and the bracketing to give it precedence, you just start to memorize them and you can do it efficiently without having to go to the advanced tab. So for example, if I just want my own, I can just go pop an M in there and go search and there you go there's two papers from way back in a, another life that I had that have uh, me as the first author SD Kruger and it's only well it's actually any person by the name of Kruger is not included and in the title is the word blood and you can see what I've come across so the advanced search systems on PubMed are an absolute bonus. If you log in and, and actually you can uh, you can up in the corner here you can see sign in you can actually make a free account it will actually record your searches for you and store them in their databases so you can come back here after you've made a very complex one you can come back and rerun that search if you want to. For example, let's just imagine I click on uh, this one here and I can show search results. That's a bit slow there. There you go. So uh, uh, actually making an account which is free. Making an account with PubMed is a really useful thing to do, and I'd recommend that to everyone. Um, I'm not. I, I'm at the moment not logged on. I'm just showing you a generic raw start, and and that's fine. Um, while we're here, I'll just go back to the, that advanced search tool again. Please, there is a tutorial. You don't need me to go through every single step of it. Can I give you a tip? Do the tutorial very worthwhile. Um, the other part I want to show you is that you can actually uh, use these sorts of searches and refine them even more by just using these hash symbols in the search. So you can go for example um, you know hash one so it knows it's a recent query and then you want to see any author with um, Eastwood and it, we better make it P for Peter because there will be lots of Eastwoods P for Peter now I don't know which one of these P's it is but if we just put a P 
we can actually put a star because that will give us any of them and we can have a look now I hope oh dear we'll just take that star off for a minute that's not the way to do that there we go come along oh what have I got wrong Ash one and Eastwood. Oh, I've done something wrong. I've either sp oh, I've got three O's in his name, have I? Ash one and Eastwood. I've spelt something wrong. Any rate, you could see what I was about there, and it keeps your complete history of those searches, and you can then pick them off and recycle them and use them. PubMed's a really useful tool. I want to show you a couple more things that are very useful to think about and it brings me to another topic actually so let's just do something simple cool um, that's something which we'll come back to later but there's a number of other databases within the Pub PubMed family um, probably not as useful as this now the other thing you can do with this is um, not only can you use it live and look at references live but you can actually download these references for further review or for using in other systems so all it is is in this send here when you click down the send you can email you can save the file to your desktop you can do all sorts of things with it so for example I always download them and then it asks you what sort of summary you would like and there's a whole series of styles that you can get I'll, I'll just get a simple style I'll just get a summary style and then it, you can create the file and it has a bit of a think now and then it will allow you to save this file on your desktop and I'll just uh, save this one so you can see it and there you go you can see it's just downloaded the summary of all of those references all 83 of them as there was which you can then use you can also download the abstracts and things as well and just as a tip this is a really neat way for me I have to go to other places to work a lot so I often on the weekend download my collection of the new references put them on my laptop and while I'm traveling on a plane I can sit and read quietly so I read them while I'm not uh, online so that's a really useful tool the little send to part here now there's plenty of videos on how to do that and everything um, and the formats are strategically chosen for example when you download them the, the the formats are strategically chosen so that they can be then taken and imported into other tools and that brings me to the tool that everyone seems to use and everyone seems to love which is EndNote um, I'll make a immediate confession I, I am not an EndNote lover um, in fact I dissuade all my grad students from using EndNote but I can understand that it's usefulness for, for early days and for some people EndNote is a uh, way to collect together a piece of software that you can buy and in fact as a student of the university you get it at a, at a substantial discount so if you want it please there is a, a process to purchase it um, just email one of the team and we'll help you um, EndNote is a methodology for storing your references and collecting them together and as you start writing uh, projects assignments reports whatever it might be you can integrate it with Word and automatically do the referencing in different styles now that sounds wonderful and everyone goes oh fantastic we can automate it except most of the things that we all work on have maybe 15 or 20 references most papers wouldn't have more than 20 references and in fact many journals refuse to accept papers with more than 20 references so in that case with tools like PubMed it doesn't take you that long to actually do each reference by hand and put them at the bottom and what that makes you do is what I've been talking about it makes you consider the gravity of the evidence that you are using and consider each one carefully as you do it 
and I find for my grad students and for my uh, undergrads that's a really valuable thing to do. The saving of two or three hours when you've spent a year writing a paper is actually in proportional terms not worth it. And in fact EndNote if you don't set it up perfectly perfectly well and you don't import all the references perfectly perfectly well makes mistakes and as a referee of articles I regularly probably more than 70 percent of the articles I will send back to the author saying there are errors and mistakes in the references and it doesn't match the style that this journal wants and you can tell after a while people who use EndNote. Notwithstanding that, many people absolutely are passionately connected to using EndNote and there are other varieties. I've experimented with one called Mandalay which is a beautiful free online cloud-based system. There are many systems about that you can use to do references with. I understand that I am the odd one out and the rest of the world uses EndNote extensively. Um, so please, have a go with it, try it. Uh, in my perspective, <laughs> make a few mistakes and learn that it's actually not as useful as people think it is. But please feel free to have a go and learn from it and use it if that suits your learning style. The other argument that's put to me all the time is that, uh, oh, it's fantastic, you can store all your references. But my answer to that is the US government spend billions of dollars a year storing all our references for all of us. Why not just use the available tool that's now available to do that? So that's where I'm going to uh, move on from EndNote. Please, uh, EndNote, sorry. PubMed. Please, I will be providing a list of short videos on how to use it effectively. There are also wonderful learning tools on the site itself. Please take time, go through those tutorials and get into the habit of learning how to use this and being an effective user of, of PubMed. You can see here, here they all are down here. Please, please, I'm, I, I can't, well I'm actually not going to speak for the full allocated period because I'm expecting you to undertake some of these videos and to learn from some of these uh, um, tutorials that are present for this tool. This is a prime thing that you need to understand how to use. I'm going to have a rest for a minute now and when I come back we will talk about how to and how to use the Cochrane library system and from the Cochrane library we will also talk about what that means in terms of the evidence that underpins your practice. So as I said I'd like to spend a few minutes now talking about Cochrane reviews and uh, what the Cochrane process is and why this is taking a very substantial standing in the world of evidence-based practice. In fact I think I'd probably go as far as to say if you want to talk about evidence-based practice your first step is to go to Cochrane and have a look there. So obviously you can see the the URL where you go to go to Cochrane reviews and this is the Cochrane website. It's grown substantially since its early days and there's many many things on it now and you know there's all sorts of ways of participating and it's a quite a substantial process now. However putting that aside the core of what Cochrane is about is accepting the position that there are now hundreds if not thousands of research papers each being a little brick in a particular story looking to, in a structured manner, bring all of that data together and rank that evidence by its quality and we'll talk about that in a separate, uh, in a separate session but rank those papers 
and distill from those papers a grand unifying story on a particular topic. The process of undertaking a Cochrane review is highly regulated, highly structured and highly based on producing the best evidence from the entire global effort in a particular topic. The process usually involves a, a collection of eminent clinicians, scientists, and in fact more recently they've included some public members of their teams as well, which I think is a rather interesting and innovative new way forward then these teams get together and work through the process of analysing the world's literature on a particular topic. Now, purely for interest, it's probably not now in your careers, but at some point you can actually get involved and join these teams. Um, there's a process of selection and there's a process of targeting you as a junior to a more senior group, and uh, it's a really interesting process to participate in yet. To be honest, I haven't yet, but a number of my colleagues have, and uh, they get great pleasure from participating. So for you as a user of Cochrane Reviews, what, what does it mean and what can you do? Um, and the process is relatively simple. Um, you go to the Cochrane website and you, you ask a question, same Google approach again. Now, just for for your own interest here the idea is actually to be very wide with your search topic because there's still only a relatively small number there's not 25 million Cochrane reviews done uh, these are fundamentally meta-analysis of existing works so they, they take a lot of time and money to complete so I always start with something relatively wide and I'm just going to do something really simple today dental and we'll just see what sort of topics are on the go in the dental area for Cochrane reviews at the moment and usually they are you know what I call the big questions and uh, that's what I like about Cochrane reviews they usually take on the big questions you know uh, do fillings last in primary teeth you know a very large question like that and I actually I'll go down here and I think that one's here I read that recently where is it um, yeah, does fluoridated milk prevent dental caries? You know, big questions, big questions. I will just click on one of these and have a look at the structure of them. So I will do the fluoride one because that's in my sort of area. So what you see on the, on the index page is a little short summary, but let's have a look at what you actually see with a uh, Cochrane review. And, and this is... Uh, Oh, and this is a lovely one because you can actually see uh, a very common problem that we face. Um, but just to give, go through the structure, you know, we can see the authorship. So remember, you know, I said we could do those sorts of quick checks. We, you then see some of the general components of what's going on. Ah, this is not a good one. Um, okay, I'll click on the full abs. Oh, well. I'll show you first and then we'll look at another one because uh, this is only showing you a small part of it. This is uh, sort of the lay public view that you see and um, and then you can go into more depth. So this gives you the quick answer. I always read these as the quick answer. Um, and then you can actually click on and go further into the depth of the question at hand. Uh, he says trying to find it actually I might I might do like chefs do and just go to the one I had open to look at and this is a, a different topic but you can actually see um, what it looks like and here this gives you the detail of, of what's been done um, and the core to this story is I'm going to stop and, and look at this part here because this is what gives you the core of how these processes are undertaken these processes are what I would call desk-based. In other words, they search the world's literature in all sorts of databases, and this gives you a list of a few of them, 
clearly uh, they use their own database Cochrane but they also use Medline which as I said to you goes by the name PubMed as well um, Embase another database and please feel free to look at these other databases as well they often have some variations on the material present in uh, PubMed and they're useful to look at um, and in this case they also searched by hand all sorts of conference proceedings on the topic as well so Cochrane reviews don't purely rest upon the peer review literature they also take into account what we call the grey literature other parts of the literature and then they take all the papers that they collect from this process and distill down based on quality and you can see here this is where they're they're articulating their quality structure in which they select the papers that they're going to use in the process of distilling the answer and then as you go further down here you start to see the very common problem of what happens they start often with a grand question and there's you know often enormous numbers of, of publications but when they put the filter of quality upon them you often find there's very few publications of adequate quality to integrate together to produce a global answer to the problems so you often find as you read the results the first line says that you know there are only three studies included in the review at the end of the day after all of this process um, and very commonly the, a Cochrane review will end with we actually don't have enough evidence of high quality to underpin making a definitive answer against a question so it's quite a common outcome so yes you can you can see how this works um, Cochrane's always produce uh, a plain language summary for the public and then just out of interest because they are a multinational team and often take EU funding and uh, and uh, WHO and things they produce their summaries in multiple languages languages so you can see that there the other thing you'll notice and in fact this is a good test I've not actually done this one but if you take the actual title of the Cochrane review what I do is I copy that title whoops I'm on an IBM today take a copy of that if you go to PubMed and put that topic in you will often find fingers crossed having not done this one ah yes there you go you will often find a uh, cross reference from PubMed to highlight that there is a Cochrane review systematic review and it's usually boxed like this at the top of PubMed so you can see uh, that it, you know it has there's been some weighty analysis of the underpinning work that leads around this topic so they are they do link together these data systems so you will see duplication in multiple places so getting back to our Cochrane review process um, the Cochrane system is a wonderful system I highly recommend it as a first stop for building your evidence underpin your practice now as I said the, the drawbacks is there's a relatively small number of these systematic reviews completed to date um, many of them come out with we actually don't have the appropriate quality evidence to underpin an answer um, and that's a reflection upon people like me as scientists that uh, uh, the quality of the evidence we produce is, is has to improve to answer some of the big questions of life so I would use this as a, a first stop in building evidence base I would also clearly you've worked out I'm a very strong proponent of using PubMed to underpin uh, further evidence base for you and lastly I would lean upon the snippets that you learn from all the other mechanisms in your life advertising gump that's put in your letterbox word of mouth all of those sorts of processes 
bring evidence and material to you. As I said at the very beginning of this hour, take that, those, weight them, think about the way you weight things, and articulate that weighting through the lens of what good evidence is. And good evidence is underpinned by process, Cochrane process for example, peer review process is, an, is another good way of giving solid evidence base to it. Take that evidence, distill it down to then reflect upon your practice and decide whether you will change your practice to follow the ways that this evidence has uh, played out in your process. This is not something that's done willy-nilly sitting around a garden table or over the Christmas party or whatever. This is actually a process that takes concentration, effort and usually, in per certainly in my personal methodology, it actually takes time to sit down and write out the process and write out what evidence you have so you can make a learned decision on whether you will change your practice or not. So I hope that introductory hour or so has given you some background to what you need to learn about in terms of collecting evidence. On the LMS I will provide you with a list of other places to go and uh, uh, read and learn about these, these systems but the best thing I can tell you to do is spend some time now experimenting, practicing and extending your skills to search for evidence and weigh that evidence. Thank you, I hope you've enjoyed the hour and I look forward to seeing you later in the year um, or next year when I come back to talk about other parts of the story.